like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thanks for joining us today here in cold, rainy Singapore. Uh, it's I, I may never get a chance to say that, so I thought I would say it because it's the only time I've been here when it's this chilly. Some of the some days the high temperatures all the way down to 27 degrees Celsius. So it's uh, get your coats out, I guess. Um, tonight we have Joyce Dillon joining us and he will be giving us a very interesting talk. Uh, but before we get to him, I want to remind you to use the Q&A function uh, to ask your questions and Merrick will get to them later. And we also have Gerald Tan, who's a PhD student in Jan Gruber's lab telling us about long-lasting GERO protection from brief rapamycin treatment. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Gerald, and I am a graduate student in the Gruber Lab here in Yale, NUS. Today, I would like to share a research article that was published in September last year, discussing the effectiveness of short-term rapamycin treatment in animal models. As we are aware, rapamycin is used in the clinical setting as an immunosuppressant and used to treat tumors, but has recently gained traction as a potential anti-aging drug. Chronic or long-term use of rapamycin, however, has been associated with negative side effects, such as insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, and anemia. As a result, this article shows promise on short-term dosing of rapamycin in order to overcome potential long-term detrimental effects associated with rapamycin. Using female fruit flies, the authors have shown that the best time to introduce rapamycin is in their earliest stage of adulthood, from day one to day 30. Introducing rapamycin later in life do still promote some form of lifespan, but are less effective compared to the long-term treatment group. Introducing rapamycin in the late stage in life, around the 80th percentile, showed no effect on longevity, indicating that the effectiveness of short-term rapamycin is dependent on age. One age-related marker found in fruit flies is the increase in dividing intestinal stem cells as the flies age, causing intestinal dysplasia. The authors hypothesize that perhaps the way rapamycin extends life was through these intestinal cells and looked at different cells that were responsible for intestinal integrity. They found out that even after rapamycin was removed from the flies, the intestinal stem cells had remained dormant and not dividing at an increased rate like in the control age flies. Rapamycin had also been reported to promote autophagy, a process in which the cells remove unnecessary or dysfunctional components to the degradation by lysosomes, promoting recycling of cellular components. In this figure, the cells are dyed different colors. The blue shows the nucleus of the cell, the green are the autophagosomes, and the red are autolysosomes. As shown in the red by the lysotracker, the short-term rapamycin treatment promoted autophagy even 10 days after treatment, suggesting a persisting effect of rapamycin. To see if these effects were also similar in mammals, the authors treated the young adult mice to rapamycin for three months, 
then remove the treatment for another six months before collecting their intestinal cells for analysis. As the cell age, their lysozymes start to diffuse through the cell instead of maintaining its granular form, shown in the top panel. The mice that were given short-term rapamycin had lesser diffusion of lysosomes compared to those in the control group, suggesting that the cells were younger than the control group. Similarly, the density of the granules also reduced as the cells age, and these hypodensity granules were less observed in the treatment group. These results suggest that short-term rapamycin treatment does have a long-term effect that can protect the intestinal cells from aging. Together, these results show that short-term rapamycin exposure can help protect aging-related markers similar to lifelong treatment of the drug, while reducing the potential adverse effects of long-term rapamycin treatment. More needs to be done to understand what short-term rapamycin treatment can do to other organs in the body, but it sure is promising in terms of intestinal health. Thank you for listening, and I hope it was informative. Thanks, Gerald. Um, George Thielen is a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Biology of Aging in Germany. Uh, since his PhD, he's been trying to unravel the genetic component of human longevity. He initially focused on common genetic variants, but currently he's more interested in rare genetic variants that are uniquely found in long-lived individuals. The title of his talk today is, Does Genetic Makeup Hold the Key to Healthy Longevity? I think that's a question we'd all like to know the answer to. So we'll hear the answers today, right, Joris? I hope so. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I hope indeed to give you some um, results that, uh, that come from recent research and I also give an overview of uh, what I have done over the past year since my PhD. So I would like to start with showing you um, the well-known lifespan curves um, that we all know have been increasing over the last century. So here's an example of data sets from the Netherlands. So we have individuals from different bird courts from the Netherlands from 1850, 1900, and 1950, and you can clearly see that the lifespan curves have been shifting to the right. However, this increase in lifespan has sadly not been accompanied by a similar increase in health span. So we really face a challenge uh, on our healthcare system. However, if we look at this extreme end of the spectrum, which is highlighted here with a black square, this picture is actually slightly different. Because if we look at the extremely long-lived individuals, we actually see that often they show a compression of morbidity. So the idea is that by studying these individuals, we might be able to identify mechanisms that are involved in healthy aging. We also know that this uh, uh, is partly heritable. So we think that the survival to an exceptional old age has at least some genetic component. How big it is, we don't know. There are no good estimates for that yet, but we actually know that if we took to take the 10% longest lived in the generation and use this as a quantitative trait, we really see that it nicely uh, goes over different families. So we actually think that there is a genetic component um, that we can study in genetic studies. So this is also kind of the, the goal of the work in my group and that I've been working on since my PhD is really studying the genetics of these long-lived individuals to find out the mechanisms that contribute to their healthy aging. So there are different approaches which you can use to study genetic uh, mechanisms. So the first approach I want to focus on, which is mostly the work I've been doing uh, in my PhD is to identify this common genetic variants that are often implicated um, in diseases in a way that if you have a high frequent, uh, frequency of the variant, the effect is often very small. So you should see it on the scale. So the more common the um, variant is in the population, the more likely it is actually that the effect is very small. So we are really looking for these variants that have often small effects. So we have been doing this for a long time. And there have many, been many different people involved in this uh, in all different kinds of studies in so-called genome-wide association studies. I will come back to what it actually is in a second, where we actually look at which genetic variants in the whole genome are actually enriched in long-lived individuals or depleted if you compare them with normal-lived individuals. And these are the findings from over all these years. So this is research since 2011. And there's one thing that is quite clearly popping up from this, namely that we often find this APOE locus. And it's 
mostly most of these studies are done in the European population, but also in East Asians, it has been shown that there are variants in APOE that or protect you against uh, becoming long-lived or actually are deleterious for you. So they are depleted in long-lived individuals. And as you can see here, and this is also important to realize, we use many different definitions to define who is long-lived. So you can use, for example, centenarians, people of 100 years. You can also do it above 85 years, or you can also use this percentile-based cutoff. So where you say, okay, we have a whole bird cohort and we only look at the individuals that belong to the 10% or 1% longest lived. And the findings have regarding APOE have been very similar, but as you can see, there are also some of these uh, loci or genetic variants that pop up that are really specific and only found in, in one uh, study. So here are some um, results of some of this, this genetic association studies, so you have an idea how it works. So here you can see on the x-axis, all the chromosomes in the genome. And here is the so-called minus log 10 p-value. And in the ideal situation, we will find a lot of uh, genetic variants that are above this red line, which is a, a 5 times 10 to the minus 8, which adjusts for all the variants you tested in the genome. But as you can see here, actually, often only APOE pops up. So this is from our latest GWAS. This is from a GWAS from um, another group where they looked at 1% longest lift, we looked at 10% longest lift, and this is uh, the latest GWAS from um, a Chinese cohort, and always APOE pops up, sometimes some other things, but nothing in common. So what is then happening with APOE? Why is it, does it seem to be so important? Well, we think that if you have carried the APOE4 allele, you actually have a decreased chance of becoming long lived. So here are from our latest study, all the different studies that participated, and in all of these, studies, you can see that if you carry the APOE allele, you have a decreased risk, because this is your risk of becoming long-lived. So you have a decreased risk of becoming long-lived. However, there's also another variant in this uh, same gene, which is actually more interesting for us, because we, if you carry that variant, you actually have an increased risk of becoming long-lived. So this is the APOE2 allele. And this actually is, is not surprising, because the APOE2 gene has been involved is in, it has been known to be involved in cardiovascular disease and also Al Alzheimer's disease. And it's known that, for example, the APOE4 allele leads to increased risk on those diseases, while APOE2 does the opposite. So that's probably this works by um, having a protective effect or, the, or a deleterious effect on these specific diseases. So although our, our GWASs have not been so successful when we take longevity as an outcome, it can still be useful for follow-up analysis. So this is an example of a paper that we recently published in which um, we looked actually in long-lived rockfish. So we took rockfish, different types of rockfishes, and they, there you have this shorter-lived rockfish and you have the longer-lived rockfish. I will not go into too much detail about that, but we actually compared the long-lived versus the short-lived and then identified several different pathways that are involved likely in the longevity of these rockfishes. And if we then looked at, uh, use the genetic data from the humans, we could actually see that some of these effects are also, are also present in the human GWAS data. So if we take kind of all genetic variants involved in this flavonoid metabolism, we could see that we have also some kind of association in the human data. So this means that it might be that this is a way in which we can actually influence longevity as well. And this can also be used in the future because all our data is publicly available. So people, if they have interesting pathways that they want to follow up, they can always look in the human data to see what is happening there. However, I also went into a slightly different direction because I thought, okay, this, this way of looking at longevity by just taking that trait is not going to be so successful. So maybe we should do something different. And the reason for that was there were already some other genetic association studies on related traits to longevity, namely on parental lifespan. So the attained age of your parents and also on health span. So which is the number of years you live before the occurrence of the first chronic diseases. And as you can see, they identify many more loci than that we did in longevity. However, if we look at this specific loci, they are not very strongly associated with longevity. Only the CDKN to B locus show some effect. So what we then first decided to do is to see, okay, if we now take these three traits, so parental lifespan, health span, and longevity, how well are they genetically correlated? So can we actually combine them? And as you can see over here, the genetic correlation was actually quite high. It's something between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 on a scale from 0 to 1. Um, if we then look 
with the, to the genetic correlation of this tree trait with different diseases, we also see that that is largely shared. So for example, if you look at coronary artery disease, it genetically correlated very well with all three traits, and the same applies to type 2 diabetes-related traits. However, there are also very specific traits genetically correlated with one of the diseases only. For example, Alzheimer's disease is genetically correlated with longevity, while cancer-related deaths, uh, cancer-related traits are often genetically correlated with things like health span. So they can be combined, but they also have some um, unique features, I would say. And we then decided to combine them. And when we did that, these are all the loci that we identified. And the one highlighted here uh, in black and red are the ones that are also associating at the single level in each of the different traits. So they have at least an a, a, um, association of a p-value of 0 0.05. And of these 10, five, the one highlighted in red, were new. So they had not been identified when we were only using the single traits. And if we zoom a bit in into this, then we actually see here all the, the, the um, genetic variants or the loci in which we identified the variants. And then we looked, okay, if we take these genetic variants, with what kind of genes are they associated? So that can be genes that are very close to it, or that can be genes that are a bit further away. And then we identified some interesting things. For example, FOXO3, you clearly see that it's associated actually with expression of that gene uh, itself, while you have also very, spe uh, very specific genetic variants that are associated with different genes that are actually a little bit further away. So it, it seems to be that if you have a genetic variant in this uh, link RNA, it's associated with expression of genes that are on other chromosomes even. And when we dived a bit deeper into it, we actually found that if you look at these specific genes, they are the strongest age-related genes in humans. So if you take a human, uh, a big um, human gene expression data set in which they did this analysis, they actually show up as the top genes being influenced by aging. And actually, their expression is increased with aging. And what we see is that our variant is decreasing their expression. So it could be kind of a master regulator of age-related gene expression. We also did some other follow-up analyses where we tried to look, okay, can we identify specific pathways that are enriched in our, for our genetic variants? And interestingly, we then found this Key metabolism to be popping up. So we actually see that genetic variation in this trait is also associated with longevity. And we also confirmed this with Mendelian randomization. So this might be an interesting pathway that we can follow up in the future. Um, so we also continued with this work, especially first author uh, Paul, that actually did then a, a large study where he combined even more traits than just the three that we show. And you can identify even more genetic variants. However, if you then look specifically at longevity, not all of these variants are actually associated with longevity as well. So in this way, you start to identify other kinds of variation that is maybe relevant for other aging-related traits, but not so much for longevity. So how do I then see the future of genetic association studies of human longevity? I think one of the issues that we are facing is that we haven't found the exact phenotype yet that we should study. So the focus has been on this 1% longest lived, 10% longest lived, but we should really focus more on the heritable trait. So ideally we can use multi-generational families where we can then really select the ones, the individuals that have the strongest genetic component and do genetic studies on those. Or we take very healthy long-lived individuals where it's actually shown that the moment they became long-lived, they were also still very healthy. Another thing that we should definitely do is include more diverse populations, because all the research that has been done so far has been on uh, populations of Euro European ancestry with a little bit done in, in, in Chinese as well. But there's a lack of data from Africa, Australia and South America. And the reason why that is important is if you look, for example, at the ApoE4 allele, which is very strongly associated um, with, this, with uh, longevity in European populations, the effect of that allele is really different between different um, populations. So it's, it's very highly prevalent, for example, in, in South America and also in Africa, but the effects on mortality or diseases are really different in those uh, areas of the world than in the European population. So it's also important to realize that what we identify in the European population does not always apply to other populations. So we should also take those into account. And the third thing is, is that I think we should use alternative approaches. I will talk about one of them in a minute, um, but several other approaches that you can think of are, for example, linkage analysis, where you're looking really specifically in families 
what is enriched in these families and follow up those genetic variants. Or we use more gene-gene or gene-environment interactions where it's really the presence of two different genetic variants that combined, so an epistatic effect, actually leads to the um, effect on the trait of interest. But I want to tell you a little bit more about the work that I'm doing now, which is actually focusing on this more rare genetic variants. And the reason that we focus on those is that we expect, although that they are very rare, so they are not very prevalent in the population, we expect that their effect on the trait is often a little bit bigger. However, what is difficult about these kind of variants is that it's actually hard to determine the causality in humans. So it's really needed that we do functional studies. So once we have identified the genetic variants, we really need to follow them up in, for example, cellular models or model organism. And the idea is that we focus on, on rare genetic variants in genes or pathways that we know are involved in lifespan regulation across species. Because if you do this genome-wide, you don't know where to start. So we need a place to start. And that's the, the, the best place to start, I would say, is if we take these genes or pathways coming from the model organisms, look in those genes and pathways if there are specific genetic variants in these long-lived people, and then follow those up um, in cells and in uh, animals. So this is actually also the, the work that my group is currently mostly focused on. So there's really this functional characterization of rare protein altering variants that we identified in long-lived individuals. And it's the research is done in three steps. So first we want to do in vitro characterization, so in cells. And for the most interesting ones, we go to the next step, which is in vivo characterization. And once we identify something interesting, we actually want to take it to the next step and we want to try to mimic the effects of the variants with specific kind of drugs to see if we can actually bring it back um, to the general population. So this is my current group, which is are all involved in this project. So I have three PhD students at the moment, um, a fourth one that was actually part of Linda's group and which, um, which I supervised and is soon going to graduate, one postdoc and, and my technician. So I first want to tell you a bit more about in vitro characterization. And for that, I would like to start with how do we actually identify this genetic variance because we use a stringent pipeline to do this. So the first thing that we do is that we look for genetic variation that has to be in a gene or uh, in a gene that has been associated with lifespan regulation in animal models. And it can be the gene itself, but it can also be a gene in a pathway that has been identified in model organisms. The second thing is that it needs to be protein altering. So we really look only at genetic variants that are in the exome and where it's actually known that they change the amino acid sequence. And we can also use this very um, interesting bioinformatics score, which is the combined annotation depletion score, where you can actually estimate how likely it is that the variant has an effect on the functioning of the protein in which it's located. Another thing that we are doing, and we, we have actually data from two different studies, so it's only for one of them, is that if we identify genetic variants in a long-lived individual, it should also be present in its uh, long-lived family members. So we use two studies. So we use the Lie Longevity study where we have this information. So we have at least two long-lived individuals per family. And if we have a variant, the variant should be present in both of them. But we also have this German longevity study where we don't have this familial data. And there it just has to be present in the long-lived individuals. And another thing which we think is very important is that it's absent in the general population. So these variants that we are working with have not been seen before in the general population. And of course, we restrict ourselves a lot with this, but in this way, we think that we're really looking at variants that are unique for these long-lived individuals. And it's not surprising that the first pathway that we focused on is actually the insulin signaling pathway. It's because it's known that this pathway has been involved in lifespan regulation across many different organisms. The effects in humans are not so clear yet. There has been some evidence that there could be common genetic variation in this FOXO3 gene, but it has not been studied that extensively yet. Um, so how do we then go ahead? So we have this identified these genetic variants, and then we actually use CRISPR-Cas9 to bring them into this haploid mouse embryonic stem cells. And the reason we use these cells is that they are very easy to target. Um, they are haploid, so we, can, we only have to target one allele, and we can easily work with them in cell culture. Another reason that we decided to first go for a mouse line is that if we see some effects in these um, cells, 
it's more likely that the effects are actually conserved in the mice and we go can go ahead to the next step, which is actually in vivo characterization. We use very in-depth uh, analysis of the, the proteins that we are studying. So we do it based on the pathway, in this case, for example, insulin IJ1 signaling, and also based on more unbiased approaches such as proteomics. And this is an example of one of the um, genes that we are looking at, where we have two different variants. And as you can see, this one um, variant increases the expression of the protein, while the other one decreases the expression of the protein. And interestingly, we also see that the one where it's increasing the expression of the protein results in this downregulation of phospho S6 and this upregulation of um, uh, sorry, yeah, the help regulation of phospho AKT, which is indicative of an effect on mTOR signaling and actually in, a, in line with what has been shown for rapamycin to a lesser extent because rapamycin would shut this down completely. So it's kind of a mild rapamycin effect that we are seeing. And if we then look at this unbiased proteomics that we have been doing, we actually see something very interesting, namely if we take different cell lines, so each cell line here. Is, is, is highlighted with a different color and we always have four replicates and we have here in total uh, nine different cell lines. We actually see that they cluster in different groups. So here we have our wild type cell lines that cluster over here. And then we have one group over here and one group over there. And we are now really trying to identify with, with my master student, Isabel, what is defining this cluster? So why are they clustering in this way? And this is work in progress, but hopefully this will help us identify kind of specific pathways or specific specific down-regulated genes or down-regulated proteins, because we actually see the same if we do unbiased proteomics to identify how we can uh, separate these different states. And ideally, if we can make something that can identify these states so that we can use that for our drug screening later on. So then I want to switch to the in vivo characterization where we have already started. So we have some of these variants where we saw this nice in vitro effects and we decided, okay, let's take them forward to actually mouse studies. And for this, we again use CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to create different mouse lines. And the initial characterization we did was to look into cells and organs. And this is an example again of um, of the mice carrying this first variant that I just talked about. So this was the data from the mouse embryonic stem cells where we saw this upregulation of the protein. And if we now look into the liver of these mice, we see actually the same, um, but only in the males. And if we look in the muscle of these mice, we actually also see upregulation, but only in the female. So it's very clear that there are really sex specific effects. And that's also the reason why we always take along both males and females uh, for a functional characterization. So we have a very detailed uh, functional characterization pipeline. So first of all, we have a cohort for lifespan. So those are running. And in three years, probably I can tell you what's happening there. Um, we have a phenotyping cohort and we have a tissue collection cohort. And during the phenotyping, we do quite a lot of detailed phenotyping. I will come to back to some results in a minute. And for the tissue collection, we uh, take the tissue in the normal state, but we also um, stimulate the insulin pathway in these mice and then take tissues to see if we identify some other things there. So one interesting thing that we already observed, this was for this mouse line carrying this first mutation that I talked about, and this is the one carrying the other mutation, is that we actually see increased litter size in these mice. We don't know why that is the case, but we are actually following the, this up now by looking in the ovaries and the testes of these mice to see if we can identify why they actually have an increased litter size. And it's quite massive. It's one or two pups per litter more uh, in every round. Um, so we also already did some phenotyping analysis and, and I show here some data. So one of the things that we, where we saw interesting differences was actually in body weight. So if we look at the body weight, we actually see that the female mice, the homozygous female mice, actually have a decreased body weight. And this goes also is in line with a decreased um, fat mass. They have an increased um, muscle mass and a decreased fat mass. And what we also see is actually that they perform better when we look at rotor rod. So they have an increased motor activity. Again, this is in the males, this is in the females. And if we quantify this, we actually see that in the, the effects seem to be really female specific. It's both in the heterozygote and the homozygote state, um, but it's really, again, sex specific. Another thing that we already have interesting data on is, is this 
um, insulin signaling uh, related tests, and insulin tolerance and glucose tolerance test. So if you look at the glucose tolerance test, both in the males and the females, we don't see any difference between our mutants and our controls, at least not for this line. However, if you look at the insulin tolerance test, we actually see a difference, namely that the heterozygous animals show an increased resistance. And this is a bit was a bit surprising, and also we don't know why it's only happening in the heterozygous state. But interestingly, this seems to be in line with what is known, for example, for the IRS1 mutant cell lines. Uh, sorry, IRS1 mutant mice, where it's known that if you knock down IRS1 in mice, you extend lifespan, and you also have effects on insulin signaling. And this is actually matching with what we are seeing, where also this insulin um, knockout mice have this increased resistance. However, of course, this was done at 450 days of age. We are still looking here now at very young age, so at, at 14 weeks of age. So we really have to see how this holds up in the future. So the next phenotyping round will be planned uh, shortly before summer and the next one much later. And then we will see if this holds or if this something is something specific just for the young time point. So we have actually some very interesting findings now, which we are continuing with. But I'm already coming to the end, and I want to give you some, um, um, <laughs> some take-home messages. The first one is that we did these large genome-wide association studies, but we were not very successful in identifying genetic variants associated with this trait. So we have this APOE2 allele, which seems to be protective, and we have this APOE4 allele, which is deleterious. And we also, by, by combining data from different kind of age-related traits, we also think now that involved, there is, might be an involvement of heme metabolism. We haven't followed up on this. It might be something that's also interesting to follow up in, for example, mouse studies or other model organisms, but we haven't done this yet. And we actually think that longevity is therefore likely more determined by rare genetic variants. And this is what my group is doing. We are following up such rare genetic variants. And we also ident already identified some of them which shows promising effects both in vitro and in vivo. And we will know in a couple of years if it's also really regulating lifespan or maybe just health span. We have to see. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot. That's that's really interesting. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, maybe I'll start though. Do we have some people that are uh, non-scientists listening? And so I thought maybe I would clear up just a couple things. You said risk of longevity. Um, what do you mean by that? Because people hear risk, they think negativity. So I thought to yeah. just ask you to clarify that just a little bit. Yeah, sorry, I, I, so I should have said increased probability. So the, the, the thing is, though, we define cases as being above a certain age. So say, for example, above 90 or 100. And then you can calculate, which we call risk, but it's actually probability. So it's an increased probability or decreased probability to become long-lived. That's what I meant with it. Also, uh, we often talk about lifespan and health span uh, on these shows, but we rarely talk about the difference between lifespan and longevity. Uh, so maybe I'd ask you to, to, to just clarify that really quickly as well. Yeah, so lifespan is a kind of the continuous trade. So what you can do is you can take an individual, look how long they lived, and do a genetic analysis on that. So in the ideal situation, you do that only on that individual. So you know how long a person has lived, and then you do a genetic analysis on that. But there are not many cohorts that have this across the lifespan. So people have been using lifespan for genetic association analysis, but then parental lifespan. So not the age of the individuals themselves, but of their parents. With the idea that this is, if it's heritable, which we think is the case with lifespan as well, then it could be reflected. But it's a suboptimal uh, thing, I would say. The ideal situation would be where you have mortality data from a whole population and do it on that. Um, and we actually think that in this way, by doing lifespan analysis, you will be able to identify genetic variants that are saying something about um, protection or actually increased risk normally of developing diseases. However, we think that by going to these more extreme people, which you normally will likely miss when you look at lifespan, we actually expect that there may be different effects there. So by, we, really, we really think that these are separate traits because these people that became extremely long-lived, like I said, show this protection against age-related diseases. And we think that comes likely from protective mechanisms that we may not able to detect when we just look across the lifespan. So that's why we always treat them as separate um, things in, in, in our analysis. Like I said, we have combined this with this combined analysis and we see that there's definitely things that are shared, 
but also that there are really specific things for, for each of the trades. So that's why we analyze them differently. Um, and our focus has mostly been on longevity because there's not so much good lifespan genetic data where there's the data from the individuals themselves, sadly. It's often said that um, the genetic component of uh, lifespan is uh, increased in people in centenarians. In other words, that they chose the right parents, whereas the rest of the population, I say this, or hopefully it's right, the rest of the population is more, you know, influenced by environment. I mean, they're obviously genetic too, but to a lesser extent genetics. Is that true? And why do you think that is? Well, what we definitely see is if we go more stringent into how we define if a person is long-lived, it seems to become more heritable. Um, so that, that seems definitely be the case. So you, that's why I think we are not there yet. Where, where is the line? So for the genetic studies we've used so far, I don't think we have been stringent enough. But we really see that, that indeed that it's more heritable if the more extreme you go. So we should really go into these more extremes and ideally indeed where you have the data from their from their parents, even their grandparents, even their grand grandparents, if possible, so you can really see how it's um, going over different generations. The problem is there we don't have the power at the moment. So we are we are also doing some studies on that together with uh, the Elin Schlagbaum, Schlagbaum's group in Leiden, where I was a PhD, where we look into these more extreme definitions. But often we just do not have enough uh, individuals to do this large scale. So and, and there's no estimate yet. This is also a problem. So if you look at lifespan, you can quite, it has been done, it has been estimated how big the genetic component is. For longevity, that's not the case. Again, because we do not have enough, for example, twin studies where this can be estimated. So we assume that it's, and we think it's really more heritable the older you get, but the actual evidence showing this with a number we don't have. Sadly. Yeah, these multi-generational cohorts are hard to come by, too. I mean, especially outside of Europe, Northern Europe, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about genetic diversity. I mean, we're doing a study here in Singapore looking at 10,000 genomes, and uh, we're looking at association, genetic associations with age acceleration using clocks, because that's what the cohort is. We don't have life lifespan or longevity data. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really, you mentioned that the importance of looking in different ethnicities. We have uh, Chinese Han, but also Malay and Indian that are really poorly represented in aging studies. And so um, some people will tell you there's not going to be that much difference. Other people are saying, wow, the, the whole spectrum could be changed. How much diversity do you think there is going to be across different races? I think there's X. I think there's actually going to be quite some diversity. We know, but with, with APOE, we know it, it pops up in both. So it also popped up in the Chinese population. But there it was, was I would say, less striking. Actually, if you look in the European populations, it's the main thing that always pops up. In the Chinese population, there were other um, loci, other genetic variants that seem to have stronger effects than APOE. It's still there, but the effect is stronger. And I think this is, APOE is one of these, these um, these variants where I expect that actually the, the ancestry is very important and especially also the environmental component. If people have been living in Africa where cholesterol metabolism and all these kind of things were not important for them at that time, mm -hmm. then the effects of APOE might be limited. But in the European population where our diet is really different, then these effects of this, this variant can also be much stronger because we know that they work on specific aspect that are also represented in our diet. So I definitely think we will identify many different variants in each population. Another thing that um, I may not highlight it enough yet is that I actually expect that there's so many ways in which you can ID become long lived that it might not be able to identify all of them. So each it could be that each family or each long lived individual has its own genetic mechanism Mm. by which we become long-lived because there's so many ways especially the other way around that you can have mutations that shorten your lifespan that it's it will be that's, that's the difficult thing it will be hard to really find common things shared among different people 
And this is the tricky part here. Well, I think the animal models are kind of hinting at that. There's lots of ways to get to longevity in animal models. It's surprising when you think about it. You know, I think when I started in the field, everybody said, wow, it's going to be really complex trait, lots of things going on. You're never going to find genetic mutations or drugs that extend lifespan. It turns out to be remarkably easy, at least in the animal model. So uh, um, easier probably than curing diseases. And so I, I think that you're right. I mean, every every successful found family may have found their own solutions, but there's probably lots of genetic paths to, to longevity. So interesting challenge. So what do you, what, tell us more about APOE. I mean, in terms of what, it, what do you think it's doing? Why is APOE too beneficial, for instance? And, and um, does the APOE2 findings, uh, do they extend to the wide range of ethnicities and studies that the APOE4 findings do? Yeah, so what we think is that but there's research on that a lot already in Alzheimer's field and all of the car cardiovascular field that, that it, it changes the binding stability of the protein. So if you have A4, it's, it's stronger binds cholesterol. If you A2, it lesser binds cholesterol. And it's a cholesterol carrier. So that's one of its, its main functions. So that's likely one of the reasons that um, we see these differences. Um, there's also effects specifically in the brain that people are looking at. The, the problem a bit with APOE and, and following this up is that it's not conserved in model organisms. So you really have to make um, tweak models, model organisms to make, to look really at APOE in them. So there's, it's known already, it was first identified uh, to be associated with longevity in 1994. And since then, I mean, we are not that much further in really pinpointing how it actually protects or how it leads to uh, an, an, a decreased um, probability of surviving. This is really still in, in progress. Yeah, we're doing, um, go ahead. Yeah, and then regarding the effect of E2, it's, it's always smaller. So we see the E4 effect is always very prevalent in different populations. Like I would say, if you take a population and you do a GWAS, at least in Europe, April E4 will pop up. APOE2 is, is much harder to find because it's, uh, first of all, its frequency is lower. So there are much less people in the population that carry it. And second, the effect is smaller. So it's harder to detect with genetic association studies. But now that we have increased our power and are looking in 10,000s of individuals, then we find it. And I think the same will apply if you do that in these other populations for, for other ethnicities. But like I said, there's not much data out there yet for other uh, ethnicities, sadly. Yeah, the, uh, we're doing a lot with APOE. We work on stem cell uh, differentiation models, uh, but we also work with mice occasionally and you have to humanize the mice. So you the, the, the people assume the mouse allele is APOE3 or it looks like it, I guess. So you have to get rid of that and replace it with the human alleles if you wanna do things. And then you have complicated phenotypes in different tissues even when you do that. So it's it's been a, uh, in a way, it points to the importance of animal models because this one is a particular problem to solve that's difficult to solve in mice. And that may be part of the reason we know so little about what it's doing, even after identifying as such an important protein. So um, anyway, I, I'll stop pontificating about my animal models. Well, maybe I won't because I wanted to ask one more question because your your approach is really dependent on on um, overlap and mechanisms between animal models and humans, because you, most of the genes and pathways you look at come from studies in animal models, and then you go backwards to animal models to validate the importance of the alleles you find. So, you know, we're in this world now where people are saying that mice are not a good model for this disease or that disease. What do you think about aging? How good of a model are mice for, for human aging? Well, I think it. I think it's it's partly a good model. I mean, this is also the, the limitation of the work I'm doing. I mean, we can do this unbiased, like I said, and then we might be able to find genetic variants that are then human specific. But the problem then is how to prove that they are actually doing something with longevity, because in the human you cannot show yeah. it. You can never assess causality. So that's why I took this approach and and really went for this pathways that are conserved and insulin signaling is. Yes, everybody says we know, we know it's associated, but not in humans. This is the problem. The effects in humans are not so, so well known or how it works, which genes will be regulated. So my goal is really to, to try to pinpoint this pathway, specifically in this pathway first, 
which part of the pathway is also kind of important in humans. And, and, the, and the nice thing here is, I think, because it's so conserved that you can study it in model organisms. So I took advantage of the fact that it's so conserved to be able to study it, because otherwise, if you take random rare variants in the genome, it's almost impossible, even, even if they are intronic, which are most of the variants that are coming from the GWAS, which means that they are not in a part of that's encoded in the protein, it's very hard to study them. And really, the, my focus is on the ones that we can actually study in, in model organisms so that we can for sure get some evidence that they are involved in lifespan regulation, health span regulation, something like that. There are also limitations there, of course, because the lifespan of mice or also flies or, or worms is differently regulated than in humans. So it might be that if you bring in these variants in the mice, it will only protect, it will not protect the mice, for example, it will not lead to a longer life, or it will just protect them against the cancer effect that is very prevalent in mice that over time, that's the main cause of death for them, that's, that's cancer, while in humans, it's cardiovascular disease. So there are always all kinds of limitations with this, but still I thought, okay, I want to try this approach and see if it works. Maybe in the end, we will find out this is not the way to go, we should do it different, but I have, have the hope that in this way we can pinpoint really the important um, mutations in humans and then mimic specifically that in humans. And we know that some of these drugs are already developed, like rapamycin, but we also know that these are still, I would say, suboptimal. I think they can still be improved. And maybe this is a way that we can more specifically find the, the specific targets in humans, which might be slightly different from the model organisms and then target those so that we target the same pathway, but in a slightly different way, which is unique to humans potentially. That's great. I could keep asking questions all day, but maybe I'll bring Merrick in because there's a lot of audience questions as well. He's been on the show uh, a few times before now, and uh, he's with the Center for Healthy Longevity here at NUS and also obstetrics and gynecology department. So he's a multifunctional guy. So, Merrick? Thank you for the introduction. Um, so there is actually a number of questions, so let's let's hit it off right away. Um, are there any potential candidates besides APOE that are involved in cardiovascular diseases that would be good predictors for longevity? So when you look at it at a genome-wide level, I would say no. But if you look and uh, if you would do it more targeted, uh, you will see that there is a, a large genetic correlation between the traits. So the genetic variants that have been found to be associated with cardiovascular disease often also show a tendency towards this, um, association with human longevity. We are very strict, to be clear. We are very strict in our studies in that we really only focus on the ones that, that are above this, we call magical threshold of, of uh, five times 10 to the minus eight. But below that, there's definitely uh, some of this variants associated with cardiovascular disease that are also potentially play a role in longevity. And you see that especially if you look at the other tra aging related traits, if you look at parental lifespan, for example, some of the variants that are pop up there are also found specifically already in cardiovascular disease. So yes, it's definitely um, it plays a role, um, but for longevity specific, we, we, we don't know. But for lifespan in general, genetic variants associated with cardiovascular disease play a role, yes. Is there any correlation between which child in sequence, first, second, third, um, and so on, survived the longest time and has the highest lifespan, health span, sorry? So can, can you please repeat so that? So is there any correlation between which child in sequence, the first, the second, the third, survived the longest time and has um, the la highest health span? Is the first born or the last born live longer? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so um, we don't know. I mean, we 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 haven't looked into that. It could be. It could be that it that it's related. I I don't have any um, I don't have any idea about this kind of data. It could be that it could be met mattering when you were born and how long you survive. The interesting thing is if we look at the families, for example, that we work with from Leiden, we see that often the families where a lot of people survive are all, all sort of bigger families. So you had actually very big families where you had multiple people surviving to a long time. So there's also this, this always this uh, discussion about the trade-off between if you have more children, um, you have a decreased survival, 
Um, but in humans, that, that effect is not so really clear. It's not really clear if that is coupled. So the fertility versus lifespan, for example. But And also not if you're coming from a big family or small family. Um, but the families that we have been working with are often actually quite big. There is a couple of questions regards of your mice studies. I will try to tackle any one. Um, how do you measure the frailty score in the mouse? Yeah, so we use at the moment this frailty index that has been developed um, what is it, a couple of years ago by, by different groups in the US. So we have this kind of um, the scoring sheet and with that, we measure frailty. What were the age of your mice in your mutant mice study? Which age, what do you, what what, do you what mean? What was the age of your mice um, uh, for the mutant mice? Yeah, so at the moment we, we, we do it at three different time points. So we do it at young age, which we, are, which we say is between three and six months. We do it at middle age. Um, 12, I have to say it correctly, around 12 months, and we do it at older age, say 22 months. We really have to see, also now we have the lifespan cohort runs a bit in front of their phenotyping cohort, so it might be that based on that, we will move the late time point a bit later or earlier if, it, if the effects are, are um, negative. So it really depends on when we will measure, but ideally the old age will be around two years for us that we will look at. And for frailty, we might also in the future do more detailed frailty assessment later on in life, because of course there it starts to deviate more. In the young age, we didn't see any differences, which is also no surprise. Yeah, we really don't detect much frailty even by 12 months. So it's... Uh, yeah. Are there any studies that would include the opposite of the longevity spectrum, for example, progeria patients? And would that make sense in the search for the longevity genes? Yeah, so there's always this discussion if, if progeria is kind of the opposite of longevity. Um, I'm not entirely sure about this. These people that have progeria often have very specific mutations and where it's very clear what leads to the progeria. So progeria is one of these syndromes where we actually already pinpointed which gene is normally involved and that mutations in that gene actually lead to this syndrome. And we don't see the opposite in humans so far in, in longevity, where we don't see that these mutations are depleted, for example, in long-lived individuals. So I'm not sure from a genetic point of view, I'm, I don't think it's, it's the best model to use as an alternative. I think what's still an interesting question is if you take shorter-lived individuals, extremely short-lived in general, so no specific syndromes, but just that die of, of normal causes of that early in life versus normal lift, this might still be something that can help us to pinpoint specific genetic variants that um, are, are detrimental for health, I would say. But my goal is always to identify the variants that are actually protective. I don't want to find a variant where it's clear that it needs you to die earlier. I, I really want to have something that makes you live longer. So I think in that sense of what would be some of the major limitations or challenges of targeting these genetic variants during aging in order to improve health span and lifespan in humans? Yeah, so one of the, the challenges, of course, okay, how are you going to mimic these effects? So the, the idea is also that I'm using this approach to really find the, the molecular levers that actually change the pathway. And then we feel that if we target potentially those specific mechanisms, we might be able to do something for the general population. But this is a challenge. We don't know yet how we could target them. I mean, it's unrealistic to be clear that we are gonna CRISPR everybody in the world and, and make these mutations in people so that they can live longer. This is, this is an unrealistic uh, thing. So it's more realistic to, to come up with potential, um, it can even be lifestyle approaches or otherwise drugs that can mimic it. And in that way, we hope that we can, um, we, see, we can get these benefits that we identified. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a challenge. We don't know if it's possible to, to mimic it and, and how to mimic it, but that would be the, the ideal, I would say. Because you can target it with CRISPR, but even we are not sure, even if we show that these variants are now leading to a, a longer life in, this, in these individuals, they have this background of other mutations, which might also be needed to get to this effect. We don't know. It might be really this combination. So I would never go for say, okay, now we're just going to, genetically manipulate people, it's more to really find the mechanisms that we can then target in different ways. Has anybody found a gene pair uh, linked to longevity yet? Uh... This is a challenge as well, because you need 
quite large studies um, to do this gene gene interaction. So there have been there's one small uh, study published where they looked at uh, genetic variation in in different pathways, and then they saw that there were some epistatic interactions. But this has not been replicated, and it's not been large scale. It was really a, a couple of hundred individuals. So this is something I would love to do. But you have, you really need the computational power, especially if we are looking at 30 million variants, for example. You if you want to take all combinations, you get to massive numbers and to get then something where you can be sure that it survives multiple testing correction, that you can really assume that it's more likely true, is very, very difficult. So there's not much effort in that direction, although I think there is something there which which we have to see how we can to can get to that. Because I expect that there will be these combinations of variants in different genes that combined will lead to much stronger effects <coughs> with the drugs. But we also see now if you do a combination of different drugs, you also see a stronger effects on lifespan in model organisms. So how far are we from longevity genetic interventions in humans? From, from, the, from targeting the mechanisms, I would say this, this, this will likely take a couple of years. I mean, there are already people in the field like, like uh, Fira's group, which have now identified this variant in search 6, where they are really kind of already going in the direction of mimicking that um, uh, with, with pharmacological intervention. So it's coming, but it will take some time. And then once we have, we really need to go again through this whole pipeline, which will take time from showing it first in organisms or organoids or something before we can actually bring it to the humans. But I think we will get there, not genetic manipulation of people, but targeting the mechanisms that we identified. That's going to happen in the next 10 years for sure. Okay, another one from the audience. Um, how important are error rates and other limitations of short red sequencing, um, such as inaccurate sequencing or repetitive sequences in relation to what you see or fail to see? Yeah, so this is a good point. So actually, the variants that we are working with, we identified with whole genome sequencing, but we validated with an independent technique. So we are pretty sure that they are really accurate. But this is a challenge. If you just use whole genome sequencing data, there will always be errors in, in the sequencing. So you really need to be sure that the variant is actually present. And we also spend a lot of time on that to make sure that that's the case. So we confirm them in the individuals themselves. But of course, for the long-lived families, we also confirm them in their family members. So it's even more likely that they are actually true variants that are really present. But the, and, and of course, what, what I should say, it becomes better nowadays with the sequencing. It becomes more and more accurate. So nowadays you can almost, if you, you, can, you can calculate the quality score for each of your variants, and it's more likely that they are actually true when you identify them sequencing. But in my view, it's always very important to also confirm them with an independent technique. What does your own data show on the importance of iron metabolism genes? Can you elaborate more, especially um, regarding the mechanism behind the HEM data? Yeah, I'm defining so you, 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 I, I like the, the, you mentioned heme metabolism and, oh, and, heme metabolism, and yes. iron. And so I wonder if you can elaborate more. Yeah, so, so how we identified it uh, in our study was actually, so when you take all these genetic variants and you look which gene they, genes they influence, this pops up. And it seems to be really driven by this LDL receptor locus. So we have a variant that is in this region where the LDL receptor is, and it influences many the expression of many different genes, also that are a bit further away. And that is something where if you if you do a combined analysis on that, then heme metabolism pops up. So we think it has something to do with potentially um, the, the effect of the LDL receptor itself, or that this is an independent effect, which could also be the case that this variant not only influences the LDL receptor, but also many other things. But we haven't dived into that yet. So it would be interesting actually to, to follow up such variants as well and to see kind of um, if this path, how this pathway is actually involved. Interestingly, it pops up also in literature from model organisms that we think that iron metabolism can be important, but we haven't really yet made the, the, the accurate connection between the human and the, and the animal data. This is something that, that would be interesting to do. Um, and it's, I would say it's on my list, but it's, it's, I'm not working on it at the moment, but it would be interesting to follow up more on. 
Uh, I'm going to have to jump in, Merrick, because we're out of time. Uh, thanks, Joris, for the great talk and the co great conversation. Uh, we'll, sometime we'll have you back to hear some more when some updates. Um, I want to remind everyone to use the um, chat function and the panelists and all attendees option to leave comments on the show. Uh, look for news from our center in the end credits, as, as well as some other QR codes, one of which uh, is about looking for people in the center who are passionate about longevity research and want to join the team. In addition, uh, there's a QR code that uh, has uh, videos from our opening last September for the Center for Healthy Longevity and Alexandra Hospital. So you can go back and see some of those. Uh, our next episode will be next Thursday night with Professor Zippy Strauss uh, from Sheba Medical Center. We don't have a title yet, but I'm going to guess it's related to aging. Uh, Andrea Meyer will be hosting that. And then I want to leave you with a final video about an 80-year-old CrossFit person. I am Jacinto Bonilla. I'm 79 years old, and I love CrossFit. What I love about CrossFit, you never fall into a routine. If I'm here, I would never know what's on for tomorrow. I wanted to do a workout for my birthday. The first Jacinto Stone was 69. And we started first running around the block, then 69 squats, 69 push-ups, 69 pull-ups, 69 kettlebell swings, 69 wall balls, 69 deadlift. Oh man. It goes up one every year. So this year, in July, when I'm 80 years old, all the exercises is 80 times. Will I have a month and five days before the storm? Hi guys, I'm on my way to do the Jacinto storm. come the day that, and I will do it. I will do it. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless. Like I'm gonna make it And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down I got my head held high I'm on my way And I'm following the signs to my happy place I'm walking in the light of a brand new Peace.